Welcome everybody to the latest episode of the Cannabis Review. I'm delighted to be joined on this episode by Mara Gordon. She's the co-founder of the renowned company Anselda. How are you keeping, Mara? Well, thank you. And yourself? I'm very well. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to have you on the show. We're going to talk about the dosing in medical cannabis on this episode. And maybe, Mara, you could give the viewer an overview of where you kind of got yourself into the cannabis industry and where you are at the moment over in the U.S.? So the, the way that I got into cannabis to in initially was because there was no uh, data around dosing and what you were taking and how you were taking it, how much to take for various diseases, et cetera. And so I decided to focus on solving the, the dosing questions uh, initially. This was back uh, 2010 when I started doing this and been working on collecting data and working with patients ever since. Okay, great. So perfect person to talk about on this topic. I'm going to jump straight away on the first topic, and that is the art of the exact dosage. It's a lot of the things I'm sure doctors are afraid of prescribing the medicine. Most people don't want to go near because there's a myriad of combinations that can be actually put together, and it all depends on the patient. Can you give everybody a little overview on your methods and what you think may be the perfect dose for different types of people? Um, yeah, the first thing I would say is there's no such thing as a perfect dose for the typical person because there is, and we all have different endocannabinoid systems and they all work differently with different diseases. However, we have been able to identify patterns um, that make it closer to a, a we, we call it a target dose where you work with a patient or you were an individual work towards a target amount of the cannabinoid uh, that they're, that they're working with. Uh, and with the understanding that they may have to exceed it or they may not ever make it to that high point if they don't need it, which is okay. But what we do is uh, we always um, look at any of the data that's out there in the research. Have there been any studies preclinical or clinical on a particular disease set? Then, um, and then we're able to look from that through our data because we have been collecting over 300 data points on each patient going in and then looking at what they're using and how they're using it and then uh, whether it's being effective or not and being able to make some, uh, some, uh, some predictions on what the target should be for various diseases. For example, if you, um, based upon the uh, research that's been done in the preclinical on uh, breast cancer, there's three major subtypes of breast cancer. We look at what is uh, uh, where the cannabinoid receptors are, whether they're present uh, within these types of breast cancer and something that we can target. We know that THC actively um, uh, activates the cannabinoid receptors. So we wanna make sure there's THC. We also know that CBD also works in another way of, of, uh, on the cancer cells through other systems within the body as well. So we might start out a, uh, a, a ratio of one to one on the amount of THC and CBD that the patient will use. Um, and then based upon where their age is, we have found that there's variances that as we get older, we need less to be able to uh, impact because of changes in the metabolism and changes that we frankly don't know yet. Um, but I always, I always uh, uh, stress that people need to start with a very, very low dose of the THC. Uh, maybe sometimes we have people that are older, uh, my age and higher, that we're, we're using like one milligram to start and titrating up very, very slowly so that we make sure that they don't have any adverse reactions. Because even though it might make uh, somebody feel too activated or too uh, much psychoactivity at a particular dose, if you titrate slowly enough, you can avoid that. And also if you stay at a certain level long enough, like a few days to a week at a certain level that makes you uncomfortable, your body will acclimate and it no longer will do that. So it, we're able to titrate people up that way. We also know that it, you need more CBD than THC because C THC is much more powerful than CBD. So when you incorporate CBD, at some point you may go from that one to one to one to two, one to three, whatever higher on the CBD. Um, as long as you have lab results that are associated with the product, and I'm talking like lab results that show the cannabinoid and terpene content 
beyond the just THC and CBD. But even with just those, if you have that, then you can calculate how many milligrams are in each dose so that you can be very controlled on taking the same thing over and over again. I made some topical here yesterday just because I'm in, I'm in Mexico right now and I didn't have access to Aunt Zelda's here. So I made some in my kitchen based on the, the, old, the old style, the way I used to make it. And I wanted it to be 10 milligrams per milliliter um, of cannabinoid. So I was able to take the uh, extract that I had, knowing the lab results that were on it, just do simple calculations. And when I figured out the volume of what I was making, I was able to then calculate out how many milligrams of cannabinoids I had to in include in order to achieve that. Um, I always recommend that people start extremely slowly. For example, you know, 2.5 milligrams as a wellness dose of THC is often what it takes to get somebody um, to the right place. If you're treating serious diseases, then it's a completely different subject. But for like something like anxiety or, or slight pain for a healthy person um, or somebody that just needs a little edge to get to sleep, that 2.5 uh, may be all they need. Okay, and would you think 2.5 would be the same when it comes to, let's say, a CBD edible? We know we're going to have an influx of them in the market a lot of the time when the novel food license applications in Europe especially go through. So do you what do you, what do you recommend as the perfect dosage for a snack bar or for a, an active treat? You know, when you're talking about CBD, it depends on how it's derived and what else is in there. Because CBD on its own may make somebody feel activated. You know, people talk about it not having any, you know, psychoactivity. It's just not true. Um, it's certainly not true if it's a whole plant where it's including terpenes and other components that may make uh, a impact how a person feels. Um, a lot of times the uh, hemp uh, varieties that are being grown have uh, higher levels of pinene in them, for example. And these might make somebody feel very, very focused or it might make somebody feel very activated um, and uncomfortable and anxious. So again, I would say that uh, if you're going to get a, 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 a candy bar or something, which first of all, I don't, I don't like that whole idea. But if you are, if you're going to get a food product, I think keeping the whole thing under, under um, 10 milligrams for that purpose is good. Maybe if you have something that can easily be subdivided uh, into pieces accurately, then you can have 100 milligrams for the whole thing with the ability to get 10. These are not medical products, though. No, they're they're talking, about, yeah, these are well, these are products for people that are self-medicating that are, you know, they have like a little minor ailment. Like maybe they just need that little edge taken off instead of having a glass of wine or a beer. So, but if you're talking about people that are ill or people that are really having trouble with pain or anxiety or, you know, PTSD, things like that, I mean, they may need 50 to 100 milligrams to accomplish it. I think that people that say that they feel a lot better from five to 10 milligrams, I think a lot of that is the placebo. Yeah. Okay. Agreed on that. Can you, I'm going to move on to the next topic. Can you tell the audience formal clinical cannabis research and trials that have happened we know that they take it an extremely long time could you maybe give an overview of where the industry is at that are there products ready to come to market apart from the handful that they already made it over here in europe what's the overview on that part you know it's interesting i was on a i was on a panel uh last week where we were talking about this exact topic and um what what I am seeing is that there's a lot of innovation going on outside of the United States. Um, the United States still has so many barriers to be able to do solid uh, research. And the barrier to entry of a drug into the marketplace from the FDA is, is much stricter than it is in some other places. The EU is pretty strict too, but, the, but it's certainly like places like Australia, where we do trials, and um, South Africa, Brazil, um, Colombia, uh, 
uh, Portugal, for example, places like that, Canada. But even with that, it takes it takes years to get something through process and millions and millions and millions of dollars to do it. Um, so, uh, for example, when we uh, through Zalira Therapeutics, which I co-founded also, when we um, when we were trialing our Xenoval product, uh, we were able to use the data that I had been accumulating through Aunt Zelda's over the years for people that had insomnia to be able to get a target dose to start with, to have a, a better opportunity and a, and a more likelihood of success um, with the trial. Because, you know, most trials uh, fail. So if you can start out with something that's already got somewhat of a track record, you have a better opportunity. But <clears throat> you have to go through everything from uh, uh, safety tests. And then you have, you have to go through a whole trial of safety. And you have something called PK, which is where you have to find out what the actual dose tolerance is so that you make sure you stay within a certain amount. Um, and then you have to try it in small group and then a larger group. And we're talking double blind placebo. It's not always so easy. Um, I had a, a, I spoke to an oncology nurse one time in pediatrics and she said, how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to, you know, do this double blind when it's so obvious which patients are vomiting and which patients aren't vomiting and which patients are happy and which patients aren't based upon, I mean, where's where's the placebo on that so it, it is very challenging um what i have recommended is that drugs go through more of a biopharmaceutical uh plant medicine nutraceutical type model of approval instead of going through the whole you know fda uh, uh system which is it can take a decade and millions and millions of dollars and there's still no guarantee that you're going to get anything to market um, I saw that Epidiolex was just approved in Spain. It's a, it's a, not a very good product, but they've spent millions and millions of dollars in years, uh, GW getting it to market. And, and it's going to be hard to, to catch up with that. The one, the one thing that I do recommend is that uh, I'm not sure whether you have this in Ireland or whether it's, uh, and that is the concept of orphan drugs, orphan diseases. And these are, these are diseases that there's not enough people that, that, are, uh, that have been diagnosed with this to justify, I mean, there's an actual number, I think it's like 250,000 or something, where there's an actual, um, where there's not enough people for the, uh, typical pharmaceutical companies to develop a treatment for them. You know, like there's not enough people with Huntington's. There's really not enough pediatric cancer. It's actually relative. I mean, in my world, it seems like it's constant, but it's really in, in reality, it's, it's rare. Um, Dravet, things like that. These are rare diseases and the obstacles to getting a drug through uh, uh, trialing is much faster. Um, we did an observational study uh, at uh, CHOPS, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, on autism, looking at four formulations there for our HOPE line. And um, I wasn't part of it, but it was my company that, that did it. And uh, um, we were able to observe based upon these, and that was groundbreaking to be able to do that at a mainstream institution. So getting a drug to market by going through an orphan designation and then prescribing it off label is a, is a really good option for getting drugs out there. That's how many, many drugs get to market. They get there for one thing and then doctors use them for many other things. Okay, very informative. I'm going to end with the last topic. We're nearly running out of time. You're in Mexico at the moment. I'm sure the, the on off again legislation that seems to be happening there. What's yeah. your overview of the industry over there at the moment? Is it ready to explode or is it still going to trottle on for another little while? I think it's going to trot along for a little while. Um, I'm speaking an event in Cancun in uh, November and it's a business and technology event. 
And my hope is that at that time, we'll be able to sit down with some more of the decision makers. I have, um, I've already been talking with, with groups that are, are going for licensing to grow and manufacture. And um, I'm, I'm hoping something will happen this year. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated uh, culture here with, you know, the history of cannabis, obviously. It's kind of funny to think about uh, people bringing now so much cannabis from California to Mexico. <laughs> when you go into the country, there's signs saying you're not allowed to bring marijuana into the country. And it's just it's just hilarious to me based upon where we came from here. I'm hoping that in the next year we'll see at least some regulation starting to take place because yes, it's been it's been uh, legalized, but there's no infrastructure yet to support it. Okay, very interesting. We'll have to get somebody on to further educate us on the Mexican industry over time. But it's been amazing talking to you, Mario. Your wealth of information, and it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope we get to chat again in the future sometime. Anytime, Ian. My pleasure. No problem. Thanks, everybody, for watching. See you next time.